because God was giving us shelter in the desert, we are commanded to build the sukkah and to stay in that, to dwell in that every year for seven uh, for seven days. And it's like annual commandment. Uh, when and being Jewish, sitting now in this sukkah uh, and eating here something, I'm dwelling here and I'm fulfilling the direct commandment of God. So I feel honored, I feel blessed by doing that. And uh, if you are not Jewish, you are joining me in, uh, in this joy of fulfilling God's commandment. So you participate in the Bible directly. Is it not exciting? And it's, uh, you, you do something that was directly, like exegetically commanded uh, to, uh, to the people of Israel and to those who want to join them. So you're, thank you for joining. Thank you for uh, for sitting here. And uh, yeah, it, it's nicely decorated. And by the way, in a, in a sukkah, it's, uh, in, uh, it's very important to receive guests. So everybody is welcome to enter. And uh, every day we receive different guests, even like, uh, like sp uh, in an unseen world. Like Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, so we, David, we received the pa uh, patriarchs. I don't remember exactly who is our guest today. Do you remember? Mm -hmm. I don't. But anyway, it's uh, it's uh, it's yeah, it's it's uh, it's the place to receive guests, to talk, to eat, to uh, to sleep if possible. So it's. And it, uh, and it should uh, you you should see the stars through the roof, and the rain should uh, go through. Now, uh, do you remember uh, uh, in uh, in Leviticus chapter twenty three? It's written that uh, well in the sukkah uh, or in sukkot seven day uh, seven days because God placed you in Sukkot, in the desert. But in the desert, we used to live not in Sukkot, but in Ohalim. It means in tents, made of skin, of leather. Uh, and so uh, Sukkah is different. So if, uh, if we don't understand the word play or Jewish, met uh, Jewish method of interpreting things by word play, we would uh, we would not understand what Moses what, or God was telling to Moses, because like you used to live in Sukkot in the desert, and every Jew would say, no, it's not true. We used to live in Achalim, not in Sukkot, and I already mentioned this word play on Sahaf giving shelter. So, with other words, live in Sukkah because God did Sahak uh, for you. So, because uh, because He was sheltering you in the desert. Anyway, uh, I I want to finish eating, <laughs> but, but if you have any questions or any comments, tell me. Why. <laughs> Uh, usually, no, we don't have it here as a uh, real decoration, but we eat much fruits. Uh, so it's it's what uh, what in some Christian traditions became like uh, I call it like a harvest uh, piece. So like uh, uh, Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving, yeah, exactly. So Thanksgiving. Uh, that's why we eat something what the land uh, produce. That's more or less traditional. But the most traditional thing is to eat something. Because uh, there is no fellowship. There is no receiving guests. There is no any, uh, any dwelling, actually, without having something to eat. The table fellowship is the highest form of the fellowship and that's if you if you know it's the uh it's the reason behind the peace offering peace sacrifice it's uh it's a meal that we used to have with each other and with god so god eats with us
That's why the Lord's Supper, the Passover uh, Seder, it's a meal. So table fellowship. That's why Paul uh, wrote that with a sinner who uh, just spoil, spoils everything, you even don't eat with him. So you are not you are not to have the fellowship in the highest form, as I said, uh, table fellowship with such. Thank you for question. <laughs> Yeah, but I want you to eat, so you can think about the answer. No, I'm fine. <laughs> uh, maybe reading too much into the text, but I'm just wondering if there's any uh, connection or analogy between John 1, where we are told that Christ came and tabernacled among us. Is there any connection between that tabernacle and the tabernacle? Great question. Yes and no. Exegetically, so a direct meaning, probably not. But it's uh, if we sitting in the sukkah, as I said, we invite guests like Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, David, uh, and we dwell with them. So when you uh, just we receive them in in this dwelling place. So it's uh, I don't think that it's like literally sukkah, but it's about the similar meaning. There is sukkah mentioned uh, somewhere else, and I will I will get there. Well, our topic uh, for today is Messa like Messianic prophecies in the Old Testament, but you should forgive me, I'm going to talk also some about Sukkot, but also Messianic prophecies on Sukkot, okay? So I will I will take it as a case. Uh, for example, do you remember uh, do you remember uh, G uh, Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration? Uh, his garments were uh, suddenly, got suddenly white, his face was shining, and Moses and Elijah appeared to him and talked uh, and talked to him, and uh, and at that time, and there was a voice that it's like it's the Messiah, the other words. And what was the rea uh, what was the reaction of Peter? Let's what? No, so called so tabernacles. No, you you all know. The, so, I don't know. It depends on the translation. Uh, and uh, another, just on a side note, sorry for jumping a little bit, on, but on a side note, do you remember, like, I will send an angel with a great trumpet. Not trumpet. It's shofar. It's a ram's horn. So sometimes, uh, if we don't know the background, it's just like, who cares? Trumpet, shofar. Trumpet is just fine. No. It has its... Uh, special meaning and significance that it's uh, ram's horn. Back to, uh, back to uh, transfiguration. Mm -hmm. So Peter, in his, uh, in his epistles, he writes, we saw Jesus in his glory on that mountain. So Peter saw Jesus uh, in his kingdom, like in the, in the kingdom glory. And his first reaction, like spontaneous reaction, was to build a sukkah. Because the prophetic significance, the messianic significance, messianic prophecy of the Sukkot is the kingdom. How we know that? Well, we can study the entire feast se uh, sequence from Passover through uh, the Feast of Tabernacles to Sukkot, but also Zechariah chapter 14. All nations will come to celebrate Sukkot in Jerusalem in the messianic kingdom if we take it more or less literally and believe in uh the kingdom here on earth uh and uh so that so so called is uh the uh, is the prophetic feast of uh in uh, of the inauguration of the messianic kingdom now uh another uh case in the bible jesus in the gospel of matthew is coming to jerusalem uh, do you remember? Uh, do you remember what people are doing as he is coming? It's just like few uh, few days before, or like Sunday be before, according to the today days account, he is coming to Jerusalem, and people take. Um, 
in the Bible, there is nothing about palm leaves. It's like branches of the trees. But why the Christian tradition says it's a Palm Sunday? There is nothing about the palms in the uh, in, in this in this uh, in the in this story. Why is it Palm Sunday? Because the Christians back then they knew that uh, in order to greet the Messiah, you take the palm uh, branches. Why? Because this is the way the Sukkot is celebrated. So for the Sukkot, we uh, use uh, four uh, four types of. Uh, uh, or what do you call it in English? Four types of like uh, species. species. Uh, so okay, four types of uh, species uh, like palm branch. Then uh, what is Mir uh, myrtle? Myrtle. Uh, and willow. You see, I don't willow, willow. and uh, it's called a trock. It's like uh, 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 it's like citrus. Uh, a type of uh, type of a citrus. So you uh, you uh, you put it all together. And you uh, and you combine it, and you uh, and you just praise God with all this. Uh, what do you call it? It's called lulav because of the palm uh, palm branch. So and you you praise God to all corners of the earth. So you start direction to uh, Jerusalem by like, like uh, shaking this uh, piece together, uh, starting uh, toward Jerusalem, and then this direction back and this direction and then uh, to, uh, uh, to the sky and then uh, to the earth. So in all, you praise God wherever. So he's, uh, he's praised uh, uh, everywhere. So uh, what we read in the mm -hmm. uh, Gospel of Matthew, they were sort of shaking lulavs. So lulav, the palm branches, uh, greeting Jesus, as the Messiah, saying to him the Messianic greeting uh, in Hebrew, Baruch Habab Hashem Adonai, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. So they were celebrating sort of like Sukkot, but it was the Passover. How is it possible? Because they thought that Sukkot is not just the day on the calendar, but it's also the inauguration of the kingdom. So you see the Messianic prof uh, prophecy in uh, in, all, in all this, uh, in in Sukkot. In the Old Testament, it's not necessarily clearly seen. Uh, it's not really seen like this. But the New Testament helps us to see the prophetic significance. Uh, there's a little bit of a certain Yeah, from the Psalms, uh, oh. Psalms of Hallel. So okay. the uh, Psalms of Hallel, the, the Psalms that we uh, sing uh, during the Passover, for example, uh, Passover Seder. Uh, these psalms uh, also they uh, they are psalms of pilgrimage, uh, praise in the uh, in the temple, but also they are prophetic regarding uh, uh, the kingdom. These are the uh, the psalms from one hundred thirteen through one hundred eighteen. And uh, this, uh, these psalms uh, we are going to sing according to the uh, rabbinic tradition, what is very plausible actually, we are going to sing these psalms in his kingdom. And one of the, uh, and one of the verses says, Baruch HaMab Adonai, so blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. And the tradition applies it to the Messiah. So the people were greeting uh, Jesus as the Messiah. And they were celebrating him as they would celebrate Sukkot, but it was the Passover. Crazy? No. Just very appropriate. And now another passage uh, with, uh, with Sukkot. With Sukkot. And that's a real one. Revelation chapter 21. Uh, it's written there, like new heaven, new earth, and there is the tabernacle of God with people. Do you remember that? There is a word, Greek word skin, what means sukkah. So the new heaven and the new earth, this is also the, uh, the prophetic uh, link to that.
So we are going to dwell in sukkah, in eschatological end times, mm -hmm. new heaven and new earth sukkah in the future. So sukkah is not just the kingdom, just 1,000 years or millennium. It's even beyond of that. So just and these are some sorts of the Feast of Sukkot and the Messianic prophecy in the Old Testament. Any other questions to, to, regarding Sukkot? What's the difference between Sukkot and the Sukkot? It's the same. It's all the same? Yeah. It's all Sukkot. Sukkot is singular, Sukkot is plural. Yeah. Well, it's in English two different words, but in uh, they stay for the they stand for the same uh, Hebrew word sukkah usually because in such. Well, and English is not my uh, mother language. That's maybe I don't know some details, but anyway. Uh, Talking of uh, of approaching the messianic prophecies in the Old Testament, uh, there are clear messianic, like direct, straight meaning, exegetical messianic prophecies, uh, like Isaiah fifty three. Right? Do you know this chapter, Isaiah fifty three, about suffering servant? Well, it's about rejecting a glorified servant. Uh, it's very clear prophecy of the Messiah, of uh, the Messiah dying for our sins, suffer, so suffering, dying, and uh, then uh, being raised and uh, reigning uh, over uh, over all nations. So it's very clear uh, Messianic prophecy uh, in the Bible. There are prophecies like this, but this, the number of these prophecies, I mean, exegetically straight, direct meaning prophecies in the Old Testament is not necessarily so high. However, Yeshua, Jesus, said the entire Hebrew Bible, so the Torah, the prophets, and the scriptures are talking about me. By saying that if we believe in him, and we, I hope, do, uh, he indicates that we can find links to him in the entire Old Testament. So, where is the first Messianic prophecy in the Old Testament? Some of you know, because I already, that's the, some, uh, some of you know my answer to that. Uh, and not just my answer, but some. So where? What? Genesis? Genesis 3, like? 315, what is, that, uh, what is said there? See a seat of the so exegetically, you cannot be absolutely clear that it's the uh, that it's messianic prophecy, but at the same time, we take it as the messianic prophecy. Why? Because we know that Yeshua was the seed of women. So, uh, in retrospective, looking back from uh, what happened uh, in the life of the Messiah. Looking back to, to the book of Genesis, we see that it was uh, that it was the prophecy. It's not clear exegetical prophecy, but that's what in uh, many uh, believers, many Christians know as the first prophecy. There is prophecies even before that. Where is the first prophecy? It was close, but not not so close. Sorry. Well, not, not well. It <laughs> well. It is maybe we can see it there, but there is something even earlier. So try, just just remember, just compare it with the New Testament. Just compare it with how the apostles were treating messianic prophecies. So where is the first messianic prophecy in the Bible? Um, you, you're asking 
uh, what for us or for the Jews? For the for the for the Jews and for us, what was the first prophecy in the Bible Jesus fulfilled? I have a thought, but I don't know. Oh, I can't tell. But since the belief that the first sight is not Sabbath yet, I'm thinking of God resting on the seventh day as being a prophecy that one day matters. Possibly. Possibly, but even earlier, so uh, that's right. John is maybe. one, uh, two, three, when, where it's uh, Trinity is involved in creation, and God said, Spirit of God was uh, okay. So, John 1 Three. 1 in the beginning, yes. <laughs> so, in the very first letter of the Bible, yeah. in the very first uh, verse uh, of, uh, of Genesis, in the beginning. Uh, in, the beginning, in the beginning, God created. So this word in the beginning is already the first Messianic prophecy. Now, how do we know that? John 1, 1. Jesus, so in the beginning, what? No, there was word in the word. So the, 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 the the Gospel of John tells us that the first messianic, the first prophecy fulfilled in Jesus is in Genesis 1.1. Do you remember uh, John, also Colossians chapter 1? Also, Jesus was there in the beginning. Yeshua was there in the beginning and he was creating everything. And everything was created through him. So it's also Genesis 1.1. So the Apostle Paul also was supporting this statement. And if we have two witnesses among the Apostles for this, uh, then we just take it for granted. It's just like Genesis 1-1, the first Messianic prophecy. That's not that I came up with, with this idea. It's in the Bible. And the Jewish tradition in Midrash Rabbah says, in the beginning Torah was Torah, and the Torah created everything. Uh, Jew, uh, rabbinic tradition relies on uh, Proverbs chapter 8, the divine chokmah, wisdom. So wisdom was creating everything and wisdom was there in the uh, in the beginning. So, but the rabbinic tradition interpreted wisdom as the Torah. And the messianic tradition, like John and Paul, interpreted that as the Messiah. But at the same time, Messiah or Yeshua is the Torah incarnate. So he is the Torah. He is not just the, the one who gave Torah, he is the Torah. Uh, so yeah. by saying that, I try to point to how to use the uh, how to use the messianic prophecies. According to the Gospel of John, to the now I, I give you like a you know, just some like some so, according to the Gospel of John, uh, chapter 1, what was the next clear Messianic prophecy in the Bible? Sabbath. Just very, uh, very, very beginning. The light. Do you remember God said that there be light? The and the light, exactly, he was the light of the world. Do you remember that the light was created before sun and moon and everything? In fact, it's amazing, but the green, the grass and the trees were created before the sun. But we know that for plants, we need the sun. How could they grow without the sun? Because there was light and the light of the world. Uh, world. And if you remember now, uh, Revelation chapter 22, should there be, is it 22? There Should there be a light in, in the New Jerusalem? Moon, uh, sun, uh, sun? No, because God and, and the Messiah are the light of, so we don't need, actually, in fact, the tree, the grass, and we, we don't really need the sun. If we have God, we have the Messiah. So this is the Messianic prophecy that we find also in the very first verses 
of uh, of the Bible. And it, it doesn't say that God created the light either. It just says let there be. Mm -hmm. And later on in Genesis 1, there's a lot of Barak over and over again, but not there. So do you think that's even because the Messiah is not created? He's the creator by whom all things are coming to be. Right. So, uh, it's very, uh, it's a, uh, it's a very good point. The thing is, with the prophecies, I, you know, during the TM Torah club, uh, when I, we were talking about exegetical meaning uh, in he, uh, in in rabbinic tradition called peshat, or trait meaning, like in the text exegesis, and midrash, interpretive meaning. Interpretive meaning is very, uh, it's it's very risky. It's not what is there exegetically, but uh, like a hidden meaning for the experienced and mature people to find. Uh, but what we see in the gospel, for example, and what we see uh, is fulfilled in Yeshua, in Jesus, it's not necessarily exegesis, but it's uh, midrash, so like hidden meaning. But I'm on a safe side if the New Testament says so. I don't want to uh, interpret things too far because it's risky, diverting uh, the meaning and contradicting to the exegetical. But if the New Testament says so, even if it's not exegesis of the Old Testament, I believe that and take it as a legitimate midrash, a legitimate interpretation of the text. Like, for example, in the beginning, the, uh, God created. Exegetically, the Messianic prophecy, no way. But John and Paul treated, uh, treated that way. And I trust them. <laughs> Just, I, I do. <laughs> and I take it by faith. And if I trust them, it's a legitimate midrash. So, uh, uh, the Messiah, uh, in order for us to to have this midrash or for for the apostles to treat it as a legitimate interpretation, even even if it's not exegetical, there has to be an open door. For example, what you just said, it's not like exegetical prophecy, but it's an open door to take it this way. Like, for example, uh, also with uh, the uh, with uh, Isaiah uh, seven fourteen, so the uh, the virgin will give birth. If we talk to uh, Old Testament professors here, they would say uh, they would say, ah, it's not necessary that it's written there. What what is in the New Testament exegetically? Maybe they're right, but the door is certainly open for the Gospels. To report us that uh, Jesus was born with a virgin, and there are some other reasons for that to take place, like it was. So we need at least open doors, and then we can find hidden Messiah in uh, in those passages, especially if the New Testament tells us this. Uh, no, it's not necessarily legitimate, uh, uh, exegetic, <laughs> because uh, why? Well. No, I, I exegetically not. That's too much. That's too much. But the door is open. Uh, yeah. Basically, uh, when the Hebrew uh, God is going to talk about it, is it Jewish tradition, all of the Jewish people, or just about those who believe in Jesus Christ? Who would celebrate Sukkot? Oh, no. It's a commandment given to a whole generation of you know, generations of the Jewish people. It doesn't matter. No, it does. If I'm Jewish, I need to celebrate that. If, if I'm an atheistic Jew or a religious Jew or Messianic Jew, 
it's just it's a commandment i should do that uh at the same time uh, as i mentioned zechariah uh, 14 says that everybody will come and celebrate that and if somebody will not come uh, the, uh or it's any some nation would not come there would not be a rain for this nation uh, so it's it's better for everybody to learn about this Sukkot. So when I uh, mm -hmm. talk to students here on campus and they just like, what is that? I say, it's Sukkah. And, uh, oh, what is, what is that? And I say, it's Leviticus chapter 23 and some other passages. Oh, I never heard of that. Fine, that's why we're here. We're going to fix it. We're going to prepare you for the kingdom celebration. You know, <laughs> That's what we have Jewish studies here on uh, at DTS for, right? To prepare you for the messianic kingdom and beyond because sukkah as as we saw as we see in the book of revelation it's also for the future the very prolonged future the eternal future any any other question or comments Oh, yeah. This is not a, a biblical question, but I just noticed that they spelled it backwards on these limits. They wrote it left to right. Wow. <laughs> <All right. laughs> yeah, cool. yeah. Who did it? It's only trash. <laughs> where, did you, where did you get it from? From the Jewish geography. <laughs> where? <laughs> sure, we can bring the Jewish people, right? <laughs> no, I'm, just, I'm just kidding. I don't know why. It's better kosher. So. <laughs> but you're very, uh, you're very good by observations. <laughs> I'm sitting here the third day, and I have noted that. <laughs> Mm -hmm. I'm going to say um, it's not only for the future you know it's not uh, it's so many things in scripture we see we have a foretaste right now of the kingdom so it is legitimate legitimate for you as, as non-Jews to get involved with it to learn and to, to celebrate it to join uh, with the Jewish community, whether it's Messianic or even non-Messianic, to demonstrate your solidarity with the Jewish people, but also to learn about uh, your faith right now. Um, and God reveals things. When you enter into the celebrations, you receive insight and understanding into the scripture that you would otherwise would, would never receive. So... Don't think it's not legitimate for you to do this. Uh, it's not commanded to you, but it is not illegitimate for you to inquire and, and be a part of it and and uh, come and support the Jewish people. And thank you. That's absolutely correct. And and also let us enjoy the fact that we uh, we just practice the Bible by doing that. So we sit here, we talk, we discuss the Bible, we talk about Yeshua, Jesus, and he said that I'm I'm dwelling with those who uh, who gathered in my name. So it's just like the best place to be here on campus right now. <laughs> Any other comments or questions regarding the Messianic prophecies? Maybe some questions, some questions. There is, by the way, there is a uh, Jewish uh, or Bible ex, uh, ex, uh, B uh, elective and Jewish studies uh, elective that is uh, called Messianic Prophecies. And I highly recommend this elective. That's any elective of JS Jewish study. So I have a question. I took that class this summer mm -hmm. with uh, Seth Postel. Yeah. And it was it was scheduled with Dr. Redalnik. Right. Yeah. Uh, and he was sort of proposing not following the dichotomy of the Peshat and the Midrash, um, saying that the Peshat is not the same 
has the literal exegetical interpretation, but that um, through a literal exegetical interpretation, you can show messianic prophecy. But he did so in a way that I hadn't heard before. I'm just curious, but I mean, are you familiar with his hermeneutic? And uh, what do you think about his approach to messianic? Prophecy? No, uh, he, uh, no, I, I'm. No, I don't. I'm not familiar with his hermeneutic, but I would. But I would compare uh, exege exegetical method and Peshat method as being pretty similar. I mean, not necessarily identical, but pretty similar. I mean, it's it's estimate. It's a good estimate. And Mitrash is just it's, Mitrash is well, well, maybe it would be compared to some other theoretical, but it's I'd say uh, I don't know if this will resonate. I, I I I know about Seth, but I don't know I don't know him. Um, I know him, but I don't know him. Yes. <laughs> and I've read his book just a little, not enough to, to Dr. Bostel, who taught the, uh, uh, what was the, the exact name of the class? Messianic prophecy. Messianic prophecy. But I do know what Israelis do with the text, which is uh, very unique. Uh, and it's it may sound at times as, as if it is midrashic, but uh, it's a lot of uh, uh, inner textual connections that's right that's a, a lot of what he was that's probably what he was doing because yeah. israelis are really good because they see so much in the text yeah. because of so much familiarity with the, the hebrew the language itself uh so i've been exposed to that and i and i and i i try to incorporate that in my in my teaching as well it go it seems like it goes a little bit beyond the uh the literal but it, it really doesn't it's just some connections that are really uh, hard to see when uh, you're not so familiar with with Hebrew. Now, now I see what is meant, mm -hmm. and I would disagree with this approach to uh, to messianic prophecies because it's not the way it functioned in the first century AD as the prophecies went fulfilled. So the uh, the if the Hebrew uh, so they they can play with Hebrew a lot, but in the first century AD they didn't do that. It was uh, so. I would I would see early rabbinic approach to messianic prophecies more legitimate and relevant for messianic prophecies than the Hebrew uh, comparison style of today. So it now I understand what what is meant. So it's it's fun, but it's not necessarily the style of uh, Matthew or John or even uh, Paul in the New Testament to interpret the. You know, interpret the Messiah. So because because it was not just comparison of he, uh, of Hebrew in the in different parts, it just do you remember it's just like similar words, uh, uh, like dark from the uh, content. Yeah, it, yeah but it, but it, uh, so it might be related to this. But it's, yeah, I, I, I'm not limiting it. I, I, I know that Matthew and, and John, they're doing a lot more than just uh, it's more, it's Inner more, control. yeah, it's, yeah, it's, more, it's, more, it's more midrash style. Yeah, and, and he was basing it off of, uh, he was doing also structural analysis. So, for example, uh, uh, in Psalm 2, kiss the sun. It says the Peshat does not allow that interpretation because it's right. terrible. Right. But there's a parallelism between the Lord and the sun. Today I've forgotten mm -hmm. it and yeah. the Lord again, and the King. And so he says, this final stanza, if you remove Kiss the Sun, then you've actually lost the parallelism. And so he he's using that to demonstrate that Kiss the Sun is actually the literal interpretation based on the structure of the psalm, and therefore it's messianic. Right. Uh, I, I, can, I, I understand that, and still I don't think that that's the way that uh, the apostles did their messianic interpretation. It's very good. It's very good, like Israeli uh, or Hebrew, Hebrew, particularly modern Hebrew type of uh, interpretation. Uh, but it's not the first century yeah. idea. That's what. That's what. But that's that's fun. <laughs> 
and certainly it's an open door. One question related to the, the, the temple and the high priest that would have, would have a temple and then we'd have a high priest that is from the tribe of Levi, right? So how the Jews will trace nowadays the the priest or the high priest from the tribe of Levi that would say, okay, now we have a high priest in the tribe of Levi and then we can have a temple and someone in the temple to do the, the stuff or it's just a mix of tribes right now. It's, we, don't, we don't know anything related to that. That's, uh, <laughs> so how we trace the tribes today? Yeah, or if we do. I mean, we call it family history mm -hmm. and tradition. Mm -hmm. uh, in a sense, uh, the only, so we, we lost tribal identity to the most part, mm -hmm. but there is one tribe that is very important and legitimate even today, the tribe of Levi and the priest, uh, priestly family in uh, Kohanim in, the, in this tribe. So from generation to generation, we tried to trace it. And uh, we uh, and we could trace it by giving the last names, uh, like for example in Eastern Europe, Rabinovich, so Rabinovich, so now it's so it's like son of a rabbi, so it's or uh, Kogan, Cohen, uh, it's uh, it's a priest. So we were we were trying to trace it by the last names, by the family tradition from generation to generation. And uh, because it's so important for us, we have been very careful with this uh, tracing, even without written uh, records. So the only, uh, in my case, I don't have any trace of Levi uh, uh, in, my, in my family history. So I have no idea what tribe I belong to. Uh, but I don't, I don't suffer of that. I'm not getting depressed because of that. Just I'm just fine with that. And the rabbinic tradition uh, says that when the Messiah comes, he will identify uh, all, all tribes. And we know we can understand biblically and exegetically why, because uh, in the prophets it's written that there will be tribal identity in the land in the restored promised land. And just to have this uh, geographical tribal identity, we will be identified. So nice, looking forward to that. Whatever tribe, well, there are some tribes I would like to belong more than <laughs> one. <laughs> but, but, but that's not for the recording. <laughs> Let me add um, yes, yes. one easy way that uh, that mm -hmm. is traced these two particular mm -hmm. families, the, the Levitical family and the Aaronic family within it, the priestly family, is in synagogue practice. So in synagogue practice, during the reading of the Torah, we divide the portion of the week in seven, seven parts. And the first part was always given to the priestly family. And then the second one was always given to the Levitical family. So that helped to keep track of who the families were. So that was a very practical way, a good tradition. Yeah. To do that. And actually, and that's part of what we need the tribal identity for to read the Torah appropriately. The first who is called, uh, it's uh, Koran. Or priest, then Levi. If, if there is no nobody of that, then uh, the, like everybody else. Also, the uh, the Aaronic benediction. Mm -hmm. Normally, it's for the Kohanim, so the priestly descent, to say. In Messianic congregations, we don't care much, right? Everybody. It's Only if you have one. <laughs> if you have twenty. Right. Yeah. In, in my congregation, there was a time where we had three. It was such a blessing. Well, so, yeah, right. Oh, yeah, you're yeah. blessed. We have just one. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and I would prefer him to be more mature. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so in, 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 in. <laughs> So, any other questions or comments?
Do you know how many, uh, well, okay. Messianic prophecies, <laughs> I just almost skipped to another topic. <laughs> Actually, uh, Vladimir, I have a question. Uh, you talked earlier about how um, the Feast of Tabernacles points to the Messianic Kingdom. Can you talk briefly about how the Day of Atonement and uh, Trumpets uh, prophetically foreshadows future things as well? Seriously? Yeah, just like... It takes hours. You have two more hours. Like the fall festivals and how they're shadowed, pointing towards. Well, uh, very, uh, very briefly, uh, I already mentioned uh, the Feast of Trumpets uh, or Zifon uh, Troa trumpets. I mean, uh, the ram's horn. So the the sound of the ram's horn, the sound of shofar. What is today Rosh Hashanah, the Jewish New Year? Uh, some uh, some people say, why should we celebrate Rosh Hashanah if there is no Rosh Hashanah or, Ju or New Year in the Bible? Uh, why should we celebrate it? Uh, very uh, very sim uh, very simple, because God was working in the Jewish people, uh, just explaining or developing the feast of shofar sound into the Jewish uh, new, uh, new Year. At the time of Yeshua, Jesus, it was already uh, considered as a Jewish uh, New Year. And uh, but the main part of this, well, there is so much to talk about. That I'm kidding. <laughs> Just like, uh, where is the new, uh, new fulfillment in the New Testament? For example, uh, Yeshua, uh, Yeshua said that I will send uh, my angel uh, with the shofar and he will uh, gather all the uh, dispersed ones in uh, Matthew chapter 20, uh, 24. It's about in gathering of Jewish people from the diaspora. In, uh, in uh, Paul in epistles, there is a shofar, a horn, a sound, and, uh, and, the, and the rapture. There is a uh, shofar uh, horn uh, sound and coming, uh, coming uh, of uh, coming G, uh, back. Jesus is coming back. Mm -hmm. There are so many different uh, horn sounds related to that. The book, uh, the book of life, uh, it's also related to the uh, to the Rosh Hashanah or uh, Jewish New Year because uh, it's an image imagery of this uh, of this feast. Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, it's the covering uh, of all sin, not of each of you as individual, but as the nation of Israel. So the national repentance. National rest, uh, national return. So chuva, chuva uh, return. So it's national return back to God, and uh, and God shows mercy to the na to the whole nation. That's uh, that's Yom Kippur or the Day of Atonement. So it's uh, it's still to be fulfilled in the future. But please keep in mind as this this report. I uh, I don't think that Jesus Yeshua is to come back necessarily in the fall. He will come when he wants or when God wants. So when when the, the time there. So I and then we will celebrate Sukkot even if it's Passover season. Okay, so even in, uh, if it's uh, in the spring. Although maybe he will keep the calendar. Why not uh, uh, come back in the fall? I can I can imagine that, but still, he can come any day. So in January we can expect him almost as well as in October. Okay. I'm thinking part of the purpose of the Feast of Tabernacles was to remind them of their time in the wilderness. Correct. Yes, uh, you came a little bit late. We ah, talked okay. about that, but anyway, go ahead. So um, maybe you've already drawn this parallel, but do you think in the kingdom celebrating Sukkot will be to remind us of our time on Earth prior to our deliverance? That's a good point. Uh, possibly, it's not explicitly said there, 
possibly the same as the Passover was reminding of the Exodus, and uh, and now the Messianic Passover. Um, uh, so uh, Yeshua say, uh, Seder reminds us of what he has done and pointing toward the future. The same as the sacrifices will be brought in the millennial kingdom, if we take it literally what is written. Although we will have no need in sacrifices any longer, reminding us of what happened, so why not? So support may remind us of God's sheltering us in all circumstances of our life. It's possible that since since the in the millennium, uh, God repeats finally, probably at, at the grandest scale, the the reenactment of the Exodus, right? So it's the final in gathering of the Jewish people. And where are they coming from? They're coming through the tribulation, right? And the nations who enter into the, the millennium as believers, they've also gone through this horrible time. And so they have much to uh, be thankful for in coming to Jerusalem to see the king because he also put shelter them through the tribulation. So it could be that there is a, a more of an immediate literal uh, yeah. reason for Thanksgiving through that wilderness, quote unquote, that God has brought them through. Good. The Sukkot yeah. festival related to the place Sukkot uh, and Exodus about Israel after Exodus, Israel journeyed from Ramses to Sukkot. So, is there any relation between them? I I don't see a direct a direct connection. Not not exegetical again. Uh, so not not like a direct meaning. It's just uh, the city that was called this way. So Sukkah was not something unique. For, uh, for Sukkot. This word is used in the Bible somewhere else uh, as well. Uh, but when we talk about the, uh, this Sukkot, we talk about this feast and Sukkah is what we mm. have here. You would, uh, you to the that you mentioned earlier that you thought that Hebrews was on the occasion of Sukkot. The book of Hebrews? Yeah. Yom Kippur. Oh, okay. It's oh, okay. more for Yom Kippur. Mm -hmm. Well, our official time is over. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Let's pray while we are in Ahsoka. Yeah. This. This tabernacle will disappear in like half an hour. It's so uh, that was really beautiful with the light. Exactly, it's so it's so beautiful with the light. <laughs> so, but let uh, let's pray. Avinu Malkeinu, our Father, our King, we are so grateful for the opportunity to just live according to your word in like such details like this sukha. And we are praising you for your assurance that you are in our midst and Yeshua, our Messiah, our Savior, is here with us. And in his presence, in the fellowship with you, with the Messiah, and with each other, we praise your name for your salvation, for your mercy, for your grace, for your protection, for you giving us shelter in all circumstances of our lives. And particularly we pray for your chosen people, Israel, for the Jewish people. We pray that you will bless them with your revelation, with the spirit of uh, God to be put out on Jewish people. For them to receive your mercy, grace, protection, and eternal salvation and restoration. We ask that you will have mercy 
for the people of Israel and save them and reveal their Messiah and King Yeshua, Jesus, to them in an even supernatural way. We pray that you will bless Israel and bless all nations for this world, world to receive your revelation and for us to sit in your tabernacle in your sukkah with you as catalogical end time sukkah soon. In the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Messiah, we pray. Amen. Amen.